Hey everyone. Good afternoon. Ev Hello. Hello. Cool. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to our first fall seminar series. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Kelly Robinson. She has been working at University of Louisiana Lafayette since 2016 in the biology department. She received her PhD from University of South Alabama in marine science, and she's worked as a postdoc at USM at Stennis and at Oregon State University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly Robinson. Thank you, Leanne, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Oh, and the light probably helps a little bit. Okay. So today I'm going to talk with you. Um, am I is the, is the volume good here? Okay. I'm going to talk with you about um, three projects that I have going on. Um, like any good science, these um, often evolve from older things. So for those of you who've known me for a while, you may see some oldie but goodie slides, but they're for context. So, you know, I'm sure with this audience, you, you already know this, but zooplankton are animals that drift with the ocean's currents. And I like to study them across different temporal and spatial scales. And really, probably the better way to look at it is across different scales of ecosystem oceanography. And so we can think about things at the individual level, the population level, or even the ecosystem level. And for me, there are a few different categories here where important processes happen at these different kind of ecosystem scales. For example, under individual, we have growth, diet, condition, behavior, populations, of course, abundance and distribution. And then moving up to the ecosystems, the distribution of organisms, of course, influence their food web interactions. And then over all of this can be influenced, for example, by things like natural climate variability as well as man-made climate change. The toolbox that I use to bring, uh, to study these types of questions um, includes fine scale plankton imagery, um, ecosystem models, spatial analysis. So we'll see examples of this, uh, these different tools um, throughout today's talk. Okay, so at the ecosystem level, I'm gonna focus mostly on a project that I have ongoing with some of your USM colleagues who are here in the room, Dr. Frank Hernandez, Dr. Kevin Dillon, um, as well as a collaborator at Oregon State, uh, Jim Rusica, focused on deep pelagic plankton communities in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And then at the population scale, we're gonna look at scales of aggregation of happiness um, in a western boundary current system. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about a project that is just wrapping up, which focused on the response of plankton assemblages to um, a large freshwater pulse from uh, Hurricane Harvey. All right, so first up is kind of the population ecosystem section. Okay, so like I said, um, this is a project that has strong um, southern myth ties, um, and many of my colleagues, except for Jim, are here in the audience, so it's exciting to have them here. For this project, the context was um, most food web models and ecosystem processes for plankton assemblages are studied, um, focused on epipelagic um, assemblages, which um, co of course corresponds to the first you know, one, zero to 200 meters of the ocean depth strata. But with the advent of the deep water horizon oil spill and the NERGA response, the National Resource Damage Assessment, there was a lot of effort taken to take samples at depths much deeper than the, the zero to 200 meters. And these samples were taken surrounding the deep water horizon blowout site. Um, um, this is a smattering of Walton Smith cruises that we pulled um, to focus on to basically develop the underlying community assemblages that are gonna go in the ecosystem model. Um, these were all conducted off the of Walton Smith and um, I, the deep water horizon site's not on here, but you guys I would hope are familiar with it. This is definitely all around the realm of it and these are all very oceanic also in character. So like I was saying, the, these stations and the sampling effort has allowed us to pull samples from not just the epipelagic, but also the mesopelagic, um, and then just the top maybe of the bathypelagic 
around there um, as the, the bottom, the, the floor of our sampling kind of sits around 1,500 meters. And this was thanks to Verena, Ring for, pu Verena for pulling this data together. So again, we're going from the epipelagic and we're mostly going to start be modeling um, in the mesopelagic, the bathypelagic. So the overall objectives um, of this uh, Gomri-funded deep sea pelagic um, project were to describe diets and trophic linkages, um, identify the environmental drivers of um, assemblage structure and vi vertical migration, and then really the, the part that I'm fascinated about and excited about is we're also developing a coupled um, vertically integrated ecosystem model um, that's using the EcoPath plus EcoTrain uh, framework. And then we can apply this model to look at different scenarios and basically perturb the ecosystem in different ways to see how sensitive um, different functional groups that are within our model may respond, for example, to changes in biomass of an important prey item, um, an oil spill, changes in temperature, et cetera. So the first thing we have to do when we're building a model is we need to get data to input and parameterize it. And we had all these zooplankton samples collected by NERDA at different depth strata, but <coughs> um, th the, they have to be analyzed. And so a quick way to do this is to use something called a zoo scan. Now I have to say um, about 75% of the samples that we're using in this project were already analyzed uh, using zoo scan by Melinda Suter at um, LSU. We did finish, um, recently just finished up the cruises um, using a zoo scan in our lab. But for those of you who are not familiar with it, essentially what you do is you take your plankton sample, you concentrate it, you sit it down, and then just like a fancy scanner, you take an aliquot, you dump it on the scanner, it takes a picture. <coughs> so that's a TIFF file there that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And then the computer program creates individual vignettes <coughs> uh, that draws boxes around each one of the animals, and then we can manually sort them. And so the little um, diagram compilation on the right kind of shows example images that you can get from ZOSCAN. So for our groups, um, here's a, an example of the types of groups that we're going to be incorporating into our model. A lot of crustaceans, amphipods, copepods, um, some gelatinous things, echinoderms. <coughs> Now, because ZOSCAN exists, um, the imagery analysis and the image and sorting is actually not done by machine learning, which I'll talk a little bit about later. This is all sorted manually. So to date, um, the up we've sorted um, either Melinda Suter or students in my lab over 300,000 different individual uh, vignettes, so plan sorting plankton, and we see a distribution of the different kind of functional groups here. When we look uh, more deeply at the community analysis, um, we, we find that, of course, for the plankton, things are typically dominated by copepods, which is our light blue in each one of these pie graphs. Now, the data here is divided up into fall 2010 on the left and spring 2011 on the right, and then each pair has a day and night. One of our challenges is that a lot of our stations were sampled only once, season or per year, and so we're just kind of pulling things together to try to get a somewhat representative sample or look, if you may, at the types of communities that exist in the deep sea. The other thing that you may notice if you just start looking at day and night is that there doesn't seem to be much difference between the two, um, and surprisingly, <coughs> that is the case. Um, the, the relative proportion of community assemblages doesn't change much between night and day for the samples that we have. Since copepods dominate our assemblages, uh, we looked a little bit deeper at the, the types of copepods that were making up that group. Um, predominantly, they're composed of palinoids followed by cycloploids. And then we were interested in seeing what the the depth distributions are, because what we're going to do here, and I, I'm going to get a little head ahead of myself, is essentially what we're doing is we're going to divide up the ocean into three separate layers. So we're going to have an epipelagic subdomain of our model, a mesopelagic subdomain, and a bathypelagic subdomain. 
And so to parameterize each one of those subdomains, we need to know the biomass of the animals that are occupying that space. So this is where understanding the vertical depth of distribution comes into play here. So that's what we're looking at here is where are our copepods um, in, the, in the vertical structure of the water column. And not surprisingly, most of them are existing in the top 200 meters in the epipelagic. So the same can be said for copepods in the springtime, with even far fewer in the mesopelagic. And then if we switch gears and we look at the protozoa, we see that, oh, there actually might be some, maybe some kind of dial vertical by migration pattern happening here in the mesopelagic where there was far fewer, um, excuse me, far fewer, yes, at depth than there was during the daytime, which is in yellow. Okay, so again, we have our three subdomains. And what our goal is, is to basically develop a model where we can pass energy from one domain to the other through a vertical structure here. Because animals, as you well know, are often making large vertical migrations between these domains. So they're not just remaining in one. So we need to have an understanding how energy um, in the form of, um, how, how energy is moving back and forth vertically in the water column. Now, while I'm just focused on the zooplankton, of course, there are many other groups that comprise the deep pelagic communities. And so we're working with Tracy Sutton and the Deep End Group to also look at animals that have strong migration patterns, have weak migration patterns, as well as they don't migrate at all. And so the model that we're gonna build is gonna go all the way from the plankton up to like large piscivorous fishes. The framework, again, that we're using is an EcoPath model. Um, EcoPath is a mass balanced model. Um, it doesn't take into account um, physics, so it's really just about uh, foo web interactions. And so um, essentially for each group, net production has to equal the energy removed from fishery senescence um, and net migration out of the system as well as by predation. What we're using here um, is a model framework that's already been built for the California shelf um, and uh, where we have three subdomains. And so uh, Jim Rusick has already built this and he looked at domains on the outer shelf, the mid shelf and near shore and um, looking at the movement again of energy in between. So what he did, he took this horizontal model essentially and he flipped it on its side. So we can look at energy movement between our epipelagic, mesopelagic, and bathypelagic um, subdomains, taking into account nutrient recycling as well as bacterial production. Now, for those of you who are familiar with EcoPath, you know that it tends to be, it's, it's designed to be a top-down model where the producers have to create enough energy or food for the consumers that give biomass estimates for. So it's a, basically it's be considered a top-down model. What Ecotran does is it flips that on its head and says, no, the consumers, there only can be as many consumers as there's enough production to support. So it's a bottom-up driven model. So that's what we're looking at here, is we take the Ecopath solution and then we map production up the food web rather than down the food web. And so we're able to account for bioenergetics. We can also propagate uncertainty and variability, which is really important when you're doing modeling. Um, perform structural scenarios. I'll show an example of that in a moment. And then lastly, um, uh, output some uh, tr food web transfer metrics that will allow us to look at which groups are most inefficient at moving energy um, between our subdomains as well as between functional groups. This is an example of the type of model, um, output food web uh, model that we can create. So here we're looking at, as an example, the relative importance of menhaden versus jellyfish in the northern Gulf of Mexico. These food webs are identical, but the colors are different here <coughs> because the focus on the one on the left is for menhaden, and then the focus on the one on the right is for jellyfish. And so the colors represent, uh, red represents reach, which is the ability of an animal to move energy up the food web, and green represents its footprint, which is the amount of production that it consumes. 
So what we can see here when we do this comparison, we see that menhaden, compared to jellyfish, move much more energy up the food web, um, and they actually consume relatively fewer production because the red color is much more intense. So we can collapse these metrics as well into system level region footprint metrics. So essentially looking at the system wide energy efficiency of different functional groups. Um, this is for the California current um, and essentially the take home message here is that you can see for example um, for compared to um, Chrysler or jellyfish, they only, they're supported by a fifth of production but they only contribute one thirtieth to um, production for upper level consumers, so it's kind of similar to the Gulf of Mexico. So we can make a conclusion that if when we compare their ability to move energy in the food web relative to forage fish, forage fish support 30 times more production as do jellyfish. So we can develop these metrics um, using these out outputs for the deep sea. All right, and lastly, here's an example of a structural scenario. So we can look at the sensitivity of the different functional groups to perturbations to the system. So on the y-axis here, we have our relative change in production, and then we have our functional groups on the x-axis. And the, um, those are box and whiskers represented there. So here we decreased menhaden by 50%, and we see the jellyfish increased as well as competitors for food resources, other <coughs> forage fish like um, sardines and anchovies. And then things that depend on menhaden, like large sharks or large parsivorous fishes and pelicans, their relative production decreased. Okay. So now we're going to go down a scale in ecosystem linkages and focus more on individuals and populations. Um, so this is work that I did at Oregon State. Um, it's focused on looking at scales of plankton patchiness in a western boundary current system. Um, this was a really fun project. And uh, so the, you guys are actually the first ones to see some of these figures. They're hot off the presses because the paper is amazing. Okay, so <coughs> what's the context? Well, larval fish, um, their mortality is largely defined during their planktonic stage for fish. So of course we know from classic work that 99.7% of all eggs and larvae do not survive to the juvenile stage. Um, and so to really understand processes intersecting recruitment to adult stock, um, you can focus on the larval stage. And if you understand even small scale drivers, that can make a huge difference later on in terms of number of fish that can recruit. So things that affect mortality are predation and finding enough food. So you have to avoid being eaten and you have to find enough food so you don't starve. So a key to this um, is patchiness, right? So if your food is homogeneously distributed, you have a very ba basically an equal chance of finding it. Same thing with your predators. If your predator is around and distributed, you're like, I don't know where you are. Um, so you can just encounter them at random. It's like the lottery, nobody wants that. So we think that plankton do much better when there's patches involved, right? So one of our challenges though is that when we use traditional sampling gear, like a net, we're integrating um, over an area, right? And so we're not really able to resolve the, the scales of aggregation of a prey or a predator field that's maybe be important, for example, to a larval fish at the scale that the individual is interested in. <coughs> Um, an analogy that I like to use is if we think about towing, if we think about putting ping pong balls on a football field, okay? And your larval <coughs> fish is at the one year line, one yard line, right? And his prey items are the scattered around him. Well, if we start towing at the other end zone, we collect all the ping pong balls, and then including that larval fish at the one yard line at the other end of the football field, and then we look at our sample, as far as we're concerned, they were all collected together. But at the scale of that larval fish, his prey may as well be on Mars, 
right? So we really need to have a better sampling technology to get at this question of whether things are actually close together to matter to an individual in terms of like surviving and finding enough food. So if prey items, for example, are randomly distributed, then our net sample probably would be a good way to look at the average um, sample of that prey field. But if they're patchy, then um, the average kind of density that we have would be a terrible way to get at that because that's not a real, real, real representation of what's happening in the water column. So the goals of this project were to, so that I'm gonna present to you today are to answer kind of three questions. So does the frequency of plankton aggregations at different scales um, vary in horizontal, vertical, or temporal frameworks? At what spatial scales are plankton patchy? And then how does patch scale vary among taxa? To accomplish this work, we were able to use a novel sampling technology called an ISIS. Um, ISIS is a toad imaging system um, that captures um, high resolution data. It has two cameras on it. The data that I'm gonna show you today is from the camera that's it's a large camera, so it has a larger field of view. And this is an example of the type of images that we can collect with the ISIS. You may have seen some of these if you're familiar with the Concord project that I know that you have been leading for the last few years. So we can really actually, particularly for the jellyfish, um, get at some almost species level identification without disturbing the animals and looking at behavior and things like that. But one of the problems of ISIS is that it collects 17 images a second. That's a large camera. The small camera collects 25 images per second. And if you tow it for an hour, or if you tow it for eight hours, which we did for one project, you generate a lot of images. And so this becomes a big data problem because there's no way, unlike the ZOSCAN, that we can manually sort through all those images. <coughs> we had an estimate, and we were in basically the Sargassum Sea. Um, I think we got around 350 million. There's no way that we can do that by hand. So one thing that we did is we took this big data problem, which consists of the 4D volume, which I just talked about, um, velocity, rapid imagery take, and then there's variety, a lot of different shapes. If you go back here for a second, there's a lot of different shapes here, right? And then uncertain classifications. We were able to use machine learning uh, through a competition that we got sponsored by Kaggle <coughs> to develop a computer algorithm that could do all this work for us. It's called the National Data Science Bowl. It was pretty cool. Booz Allen and Hamilton put up the prize money. It was like 250K. And so the winning solution was basically able to correctly identify our different functional groups, most of them at an 80% precision level. And for the ones that we really cared about for this project, it certainly achieved, it was like 70%, and then for its prey items, it was about 80 or even above 80%. So we were pretty happy with it. So how do we actually um, get at this question in terms of the classifier? Do you want to know deeper into the details? Well, so what ISIS does is it essentially creates a video that's one long strip. And then the computer program divides up those strips into individual TIFF frames. It's an ABI file. And then we take each one of those individual TIFF files, those pictures from that strip, and then we again do that process where we create vignettes around each individual particle and then that particle is going to be identified. <coughs> so we take our raw image, we segment it, that's the vignette creation. We train the computer to recognize all our different functional groups. For this case, we were using a sparse convolutional network. We have our classified images and then we do a manual correction using a confusion matrix. So this was a new technique, um, and it's been written up in LLM methods a couple years ago. Um, it was led by Jessica Lowe. All right, so we got our computer identifier images for us and we can manually correct them. That just took us three years, actually. That was most of my postdoc was trying to figure out how to make all that work. Um, so now we're onto the fun part, which is answering the science questions. Okay, so our study area is the Florida Strait, which is a western boundary current system. 
Um, we're looking at an image here from earthschool.net, which is showing the, the, the current, which is in yellow here. And so we see that there's a much higher velocity um, towards the western side versus the eastern side, closer to the Bahamas. And as a result of this flow, isopycnals tend to tilt upward at the western edge. And we had to have a shallow, dense, salty water, as well as outflowing of nutrients. And so what this creates is a gradient in productivity, where the west tends to be more um, productive um, than the east. So with productivity declining west to east across the straits, as well as the west and east kind of being distinct uh, physical uh, environments. So to look at scales of patchiness and plankton in different horizontal, vertical, and temporal frameworks, we sampled the system during two different years. <coughs> we looked, we had transects in the west, central, east to look at that spatial framework question. And then we also sampled within each one of those areas at, um, at a few different depth strata. So in 2014, we did three depth strata, shallow, mid, and deep. And then in 2015, we only did the shallow and the mid ones um, due to logistical constraints. Uh, the transect length we aimed for was 10 kilometers. And to maintain, to make sure that we were sampling the same water mass, we were ensure that we maintain the same distance to a drogue drifter. So we were kind of moving with that water mass as it came around um, uh, and was in the current. All right. So. The part that I did was identify the plankton patches, and this was a bit of a this was a bit of a journey for me. So the, the analysis that I landed on was something that's already been published. Um, it's called "Distance to Next Encounter" by Curry et al. 1998, and then it was also used by Adam Greer um, in 2016 to for some um, data that he worked up for his dissertation. So the way that it works is if you can imagine a camera that's going along and it's taking pictures of all your animals, right? You're going to have some animals and then no animals and some more animals. And so you're trying to identify the distance that where the animals are close enough together where they're in a patch and then the distance where you're separating the patches and then you're going to sometimes have animals that are by themselves. And we call them pawn for solo. So if you did a, a plot of the distances on a histogram, right, you would get something that looks like this, ideally. So um, you have the number of observations, or your count on your y-axis, and then you have your distance bins on your x-axis. So you would have distances that were shorter or closer together. You would have a much higher frequency, and then you ideally have a break, and then you would have some distances where the animals were further apart. And so that break is called the D-max, the circle there in red. So that's the important threshold that's going to donate whether animals are in a patch or not in a patch. Well, so I, I wandered on and I just worked on patches and no patch in a very binary fashion. And then I realized that we had a bit of a problem in that just because animals are closer together doesn't necessarily mean that they're like highly aggregated, right? Um, and so what happened in the evolution of the story is that we came up with essentially four partial types, I'm going to call them. So the first type was the patches. These are the highly aggregated parcels. So there was two criteria that were applied to this. So one, the animals were close enough together, like I showed you before, that they could be considered in a patch. And then the second criteria was that the density of that parcel had to be above three standard deviations above the background mean. Right? So there's a lot of animals and they were close together. The second parcel type then is a step down from that. This is the aggregated parcels. So in this case, the animals are close enough together to be considered in a patch, but they don't meet that density threshold. And then the third parcel type is random. Nobody's close together. You guys are just, they're just randomly distributed. And then the last parcel type, um, that's not up here, but the one where there was essentially empty water, zero parcels. So we went along our ISIS transects, and using um, R, we identified these different parcel types here. Okay, so when we run this over the, the data, this is the kind of output that we can get. So what we're looking at here is the output of fish patches um, for our both of our years here. So the station 
is on the y-axis. The distance along our transect oriented west to east is on along our x-axis. And then the each patch is outlined by a black line. And then the density of the animals is that color gradient. So the warmer the color, the more animals there are, are in that box, okay? And so if we look at the same area in two different years, we can see differences for, oh, that went away. Go back. We can, uh, we, well, I, sorry, I took this away. We can see differences between the two different years. For example, shallow is on the uh, left and mid is on the right. So now we can start making comparisons and we get metrics about how long the patches are, how many animals are in them, um, things like that, which is really, really nice and can help us kind of get at this question. Okay. So, I did a long song and dance about the method, so just bringing back our questions, we're listed in the frequency, the scale of patchiness, and whether it varies among taxa. So the first question is, does the frequency of patches, patch parcels, vary in temporal, spatial, or horizontal frameworks? And the ans short answer is yes. So here what we're looking at um, are the weighted counts um, and I'm going to say weighted because we sampled unevenly in each one of our areas, and so the counts have been weighted for sampling effort. And we have our area here on the x-axis, so west, central, and east, and then the colors denote the different depth strata. Light blue is shallow, the mid blue is the depth, and then the darkest blue is our deepest site. And that's why the dark blue is missing from 2015 on the bottom three panels here. So when we focus on the leftmost column, our patch column here, we see that with frequency of occurrence in the shallow in 2014, there is a decline from west to east, right? The highest number of patches are in the west and the decline across the strength. In fact, this is a significant relationship. Um, we see the same pattern in 2015. For aggregated parcels, however, we see an inverse pattern. There's actually more aggregated parcels as you move west to east. So there's more aggregated par parcels in the east. And then thankfully, I was kind of happy to see this with random parcels, there's no difference at all. They're just randomly distributed. <laughs> now, when we look at the size of the parcel, <coughs> this is getting at the question of patch, the scaling of patches, of plankton patches. <coughs> so I used parcel length in this case as a scale. <coughs> If we group all our plankton groups together and we look at their distributions, this is a kernel density plot, and these have been log transformed, we see that there's basically no difference. They all overlap with each other. However, when we parse them out by group, we see a little bit of a different story. So I apologize for the small and mini plot text of this. I'm going to find a better way to present this. But this is parcel <coughs> so the same thing you saw before, but broken out now by um, into 10 different groups. And the color structure is the same. So uh, for the box and whisker plots, the light blue, blue colors are gonna be 2014. And then for 2015, that's gonna be our orangish colors. And then you're gonna move across the straits, west to east across the bar plot. So the shallow west, going to be on your furthest left. Let's see if I can get a pointer here. Okay, cool. All right. So I'll have, I would like you, if you can, to focus on this larval fish plot on the upper left. And if we look at the shallow, the light blue box and whisker, we see that there's a decline across the straits, right, in 2014. We're seeing the same pattern for the mid-depth. And in fact, if we look at 2014, we also see that there tends to be more um, patch, the patch parcels tend to be larger, excuse me, in the west and the shallow than they do in the central on the east. And so for a number of different groups, we see the same pattern where it appears that patch size or scale is varying with the project productivity gradient across the straits. So we see variability in a horizontal framework. Not only that, because we are able to look at the two different years here, we see that generally pat patches in 2014 
um, tend to be larger than those in 2014. And when we do statistics for uh, multiple, several of these groups, these temporal differences are statistically significant. And we also see differences with depth strata. So these are hot off the presses and it's really excited that we actually are able to see that there is variability at fine scales and plankton patchiness um, between years in space and with depth strata. Ooh, wrong way. Okay, so that was patch particles that I just showed you. Now, we're gonna look at the same metric though for the lower level aggregated particles. So these are the ones that didn't meet the density threshold. And you see a similar pattern in the larval fish. There's a decline across the straits. There's a, the other thing though that kind of jumped out at me that if you look between these groups, I'm gonna jump back here. Look at the, the error bars or the 95% quantile bars up here. Um, for the ag aggregated particles, there's actually way more variability. So for some of these, I've actually zoomed in so that we can see the box and whiskers more. There's actually more outliers for like gelatinous plankton and things like that. So there's a lot more variability in patch scale. But there's a lot of the same patterns are happening where we see declines in aggregated patch, aggregated partial scale, excuse me, as we go from the west um, down across the east. Okay, so I wanted to also look at the idea of scaling in a different way. And so I took all the, um, the lengths of our different partial types, patch, aggregated, uh, random and zeros, and I found the largest mode. And to try to get, a, can we have one number that kind of describes the scale of aggregation or randomness for each one of our functional groups? So that's what you're looking at here is a very large and rather busy chart that shows the dominant mode for uh, partial length. So I'm gonna try to minimize this a little bit and we're just gonna focus on the top five groups here to help bring you in. Okay, so I've just pulled out the top five groups here uh, to minimize some of the busyness here. And um, these have text boxes on them because they were in orange and they did not show up well on the monitor. Okay, so what we're looking at here, this is a log scale. We have our groups, we have our different parcel types. Um, and then the number here actually represents the actual number of our mode. So this is the scale of this particle length here. here. So okay. the patch for fish, which is our top group here, so this you can see the scale of patchiness for fish is around 35 meters. For aggregated, it's around 96. Random, it's 148. If we look at apendicularians, which is for larval fish in this area, are an important prey item, we see that they actually, for patchy, they're at over 10,000 meters or about 10 kilometers. Well, if you remember for the methods, our transects were about 10 kilometers. And so the problem that we've encountered is that for some of these taxa that are actually very abundant, we weren't able to identify, in many cases, actual patches um, and what we think might be happening is that in some cases, the scale of these patches may be beyond the sampling effort that we did. So one thing that we're gonna do is we have another project where we basically have the ice system of water for eight hours at a time in the same area. And we're gonna see if we can actually identify patches for these highly abundant organisms using those data. Essentially, maybe it was a sampling effort problem. For the aggregated, the larvae, the apodicularians, though, were about 100. And so, you know, what you can say about this, though, is that, you know, the getting back to this question, is there prey available for the larval fish to eat? And apodicularians are an important prey item? Well, the answer is yes. They do seem to kind of, at least, there's similarity in scale here in terms of the dominant modes. So not everyone has an ISIS. And if you want to look at patchiness, it'd be nice if you could be able to predict what that scale of aggregation is for the group that you care about. And so one interesting outcome of this analysis was that we found that there was a relationship between the overall group density, and this is correcting for the confusion matrices, so we're correcting for the computer making mistakes, um, and the dominant length scale of that group that we found. So this plot is removing 
all of those groups where basically the parcel mode was above um, 10 kilometers because that's not, we don't think that's a valid number this way, but we don't know where the, the path ends. So we've taken those out here. So that's why you're seeing fewer groups. But when we have the groups that are left, we see that there's not a super great, but there's still an interrelationship between plankton patch mode and the corrected densities, and it's significant. So there's the possibility that we could use plankton density as a way to predict what your dominant length scale is going to be in the horizontal framework. Okay, so in summary for this project, we saw that frequency varied, frequency of patches varied, as well as our aggregate parcel, parcels. Um, the absolute distribution of plankton patches was similar when you just included all the groups, but when you looked at group by group, we saw that there was variability across temporal, spatial, and um, frameworks, including across the straits as well as with depth. And that lastly, um, plankton tend to be mostly patchy, about 25 kilometers. And then variation patch aggregations was really, there was a lot of variability when we get at the aggregated level. Okay. All right, so I'm at 443, so I've got 10 minutes left, if that's right. Um, the last project that I'm gonna talk about um, is um, a NSF funded project focused on the response of plankton assemblages to Hurricane Harvey work. Um, basically a massive freshwater plume that resulted. So if you may remember, Hurricane Harvey was special storm in that it just stalled over Houston. And it dumped an incredible amount of rain over this area, over 40 inches in six days. So the results of that, including the devastation that happened to a lot of coastal communities, was there was a large amount of fresh water that got dumped in to the northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And so what we're looking at here is a time series from a river gauge. Um, we have our year on the x-axis, and on our left y-axis we have chlorophyll, total chlorophyll, and then on the right y-axis we have the log scale of river discharge. And so there, I want you to focus a little bit more on the purple, if you might. Um, and here, these little lines were outlining different, what you call like kind of freshwater disturbance events. And so as we go through time, we see some spikes from hurricanes, um, some floods, the little peaks here in the purple. But when we get to where, Her where Harvey hit, we see that this peak is far above any of these kind of other disturbance events in terms of its magnitude. And so our question that we had was, well, how do planktonic systems respond to these kind of seasonally, this a large, seasonally anomalous floodwater plume generated by an event like a Hurricane Harvey? And so we were interested in fluid web interactions um, and how they vary in space and time. How does this, how does the, the assemblage structure, um, how does it compare to historical series in terms of like, does the assemblage, is the assemblage the same as during like a neutral year or during another floodwater event? Is there a floodwater kind of assemblage that develops? And then what are the implications of this event for kind of long-term ecosystem productivity in terms of like, you know, fisheries and things like that, um, as well as um, energy in the system? So for this talk, I'm just gonna focus on the first one. We're still working at the historical data and the fisheries implications. So this is our team. We um, were lucky enough to get three cruises um, at two month intervals after the storm hit. Um, we were on the Pelican. We were actually, excuse me, we were on the Point Sur for the first one. I harassed NSF about that. I was like, there's no boats, put me on the Sur. And <laughs> we thought of, I don't know if you've been to Lumcon, there was talk of like putting people in the Acadiana. It was like a tiny ship that can have like two people on it. We're like, anyway, so. <laughs> I was very happy to be on the point, sir. It's a very nice boat. For the next two cruises, we are at Lumpcon. We were on the Pelican. Um, again, we're using Zoscan here to kind of allow us for rapid assemblage structure evaluation. Um, so far, we probably have more. No, we, we're pretty much finished with this. We have about 400,000 vignettes sorted by our awesome undergrads in our lab, Andrea Turcrew, 
and Aiden Creason. Andrea has now moved on to being a graduate student, so I'm very proud of her. And Aiden was accepted to medical school. So these are good guys. All right, so our sampling stations coincided with previous data, which is key, collected by the CMAP time series, um, as well as a cruise that my collaborator Beth Stoffer and Astro Schneitzer had gone on for, it's called GOMEX, and they were looking at carbon. It was actually pretty awesome. They literally had been out at this area one month before Harvey hit, so we had some really nice pre-storm data that we could use. And you can see that our spatial gradient, we're going near shore to off the shelf. And then we were actually, we used, while we had three cruises funded, we also were able to use data from a NOAA cruise that went out in September. So if you may remember Harvey hit in August, and so the NOAA cruise went out in September, and then our cruises are October, January, and March. So essentially we have four time points here. And so what you're looking at here is a non-dimensional scaling plot showing, hopefully, well, it's not showing this, it's showing the, the kind of the aggregations of the planktonic assemblages for each one of these time points. And the shapes are the spatial components. So the circles are near shore and the triangles are mid-shelf. And so one thing that pops out is that our September cruise, the NOAA cruise, the one that was most recent after Harvey, is different than our October and definitely our March and things like that. So we're seeing a kind of the succession, right, of assemblages. There are different uh, communities that are developing. One question that my student Zach is really interested in is along the lines of disturbance. So if we think about the freshwater plume as a disturbance event, what, how is, what is the response? Do we kind of see this classical intermediate disturbance hypothesis response where you get a monotonic kind of basically bell-shaped or hum-shaped um, response from the diversity? And so when he looked at the diversity metrics um, in a spatial context, so we're here near, mid, and offshore, we have Shannon's, um, and uh, we have Grixis here at the top. We see that there, there's a, there's a little bit of a bump there for, for richness, but we, we really don't, there's not a statistical difference um, compared from mid and offshore with diversity, but there is between near and mid. So the highest diversity was happening mid-shelf. So we look at this data in a temporal framework. So again, we have our different cruise points here, September, October, January, March on the x-axis. And we have our richness metrics and our diversity metrics, standings here on the y-axis. We see that we get <coughs> what you kind of expect with the classic IDH, right? Where diversity is peaking at the intermediate time point, which is pretty cool. So um, this is in prep and uh, we're looking forward to coming out and kind of sharing it. There's been a lot of interest with uh, the effect of hurricane and different marine ecosystems. Okay, so in summary for this particular part, um, we saw that GoFrances did shift in response to Hurricane Harvey. Um, granted, we just have one time point, so we are doing historical analysis to evaluate whether that was just kind of a normal seasonal shift, so please stay tuned. We did find that mid-shelf diversity was higher relative to near-shore diversity, and that we also saw that there was kind of a classic IDH response where um, at the intermediate time point, uh, plankton diversity peaked. And so I think I've reached the end of my time, and so in closing, I'd really like to thank all of my collaborators, including those here in the audience, and for all of you for coming to hear me speak. And I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Like how to completely make this work. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So that's, yeah, that's all the confusion matrix. So you can have ones, okay, so there's a couple different ways, right? So it, you can have the ones where they were falsely positive, right? So they were incorrectly identified as belonging to that group. You can have the ones that were false negatives, so they were incorrectly, like, not associated with that group. Um, and so the way that you get about that is um, you literally just pull a representative sample. I think for our confusion matrix, gosh, what did we sort? We sorted about 300,000 manual images, and we did that exercise where we found the proportion that were false positive and false negative, and then you can get an F metric that essentially is a constant that you can apply to your counts. And so, for example, if I remember correctly, Apidicularians, the machine did really great at. And so basically its constant was one, so there was no change to maybe the density. In contrast, for larval fish, it made a mistake about two. So there was actually two times as many larval fish, we think, that were in, in the ecosystem that the machine was able to identify. Yeah, it, so it's the, the, the problem, it, the challenge is, is that it's essentially just a constant that you apply to your counts. So there's going to be uh, orders of magnitude change, but not relative changes, right? Because for each group, you're just like, multiply by two. Yeah. That's right. When it says confusion matrix corrected, that's what's been happening. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So, okay. Maybe if I walk you through how to do uncertainty, it might help answer your question. Um, so, the with Ecotran, okay, so Ecopath, you fill out a bunch of parameter sheets, diet, biomass, et cetera, right? Like any two love model. Yeah, with, but it's like, right, and then you have a parallel mirror for each one of those sheets. You have a CV associated with each one of those parameters. And so when we can, we'll either, we'll actually get at that from the data itself. Um, if it's not available, we'll set it using published kind of accepted limits, right? And then when we run our simulations, um, we let it go for a uh, 1,000 simulations. And so it's going to generate food web models, 1,000 food web models that are balanced, that where it takes each one of those CVs and it varies the value of each parameter within the range of that CV. That is correct. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so the output, what you were seeing there was you get like a matrix of a thousand simulations and then you're just doing the math on that. So it's like the mean output and then the quantiles and things like that. Yeah. Almost like it's, you think it's being like overfit. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's harvest rate, and that's a it's an aggregated. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Okay. Um, so, this is this is one of the drawbacks of kind of doing these kind of models, um, is that it is very much an average snapshot. So what we did, for example, for the I think the example scenario that I showed for the um, eco the Gulf of Mexico model, we eventually took like all the data that we had over all the years and we collapsed it. We just took a long term temporal average. So innately, we are by doing that removing a lot of that temporal variance. Yeah. So it would the there's a a, a thing that I, uh, we haven't talked about and we're going to do this I think for our Gulf of Mexico deep Puebla model um, is to try to do it dynamic where we allow it to vary through time. I mean, I think the validation would be kind of the inadvertent experiment that we did when the oil spill happened, right? Where you shut the fishery off, right? And so you could simulate that in this and be like, do we see the same response that we did when you shut the fishery down? Right. And like, I think, what was it? Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Like, things that we are really species of concern, like red snapper, were like just bonkers and, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You mean basically part having better taxonomic resolution? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the kind of the underlying thing is is that we knew we need so we, we do have better resolved data for the seabirds. I think it was there was brown pelicans, there was terns, there was another group where we got the diets and the parameters for each one of those. But one of the challenges with modeling is that you're not gonna get all the parameters often for all the groups. And so to kind of to try to let us move forward, what we did is we took an average and that created our seabird group. Um, the Odontocetans, um, 